Welcome all to my paranormal closet where the stories and magic take place. Today's guest has been fascinated with ghosts ever since her early teens when she had numerous experiences and encounters in her childhood home in New Jersey. In 1998, she sought out the New Jersey Ghost Hunter Society due to her interest and experiences before eventually becoming a member and has been hooked on this field ever since. She has been published in the book anthologies, Ghostly Tales from America's Jails by Atriot Press and Ghost Hunting USA by Clerisy Press and made appearances on local television networks and newspapers. When not busy with ghosts, she's busy raising her two children and continues to offer her energy healing services. She also performs house clearings and cleansings. Her passions include horseback riding, movies, border collies, traveling, forensic psychology, and the soul's wisdom. She works as a nurse and lives in Warren County, New Jersey with her chaotic family. Please join me in welcoming Dina Chirico to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I remember reaching out to you when I was writing my Warren County Hauntings and Other Strange Phenomena book because you had so many stories, but especially stories to share about Charlie Brown's, which was in Hackettstown at one point. Very old yes. building, very active building, in fact. <laughs> yes, and it changed the- hands again. Oh, what is it called now? Um, Something Grill. It's really? no longer Dean McNally's. It's something else now. No kidding, huh? Mm-hmm. I wonder if the ghosts had anything to do with that. I don't know. You know, a funny thing, um, one of my former team members, you know, was saying, oh, I, I can get us in there for an interview, get us in there for an interview. And this is already, I had already had the full chapter on Charlie Brown's mm-hmm. and um, some stories from even before it was Charlie Brown. So I really didn't need B. McNally's input, but if they wanted us to have an investigation, great. So she had come back to me and she had said, um, well, they don't want the information put in a book. So next thing I know, this former member is having an investigation with other people at the building. <laughs> and wow. they're video, videotaping the whole thing. Talk about, you know, drama in, in the yes. paranormal world. I was like, wow, they don't want it in the book, but it's okay to have it on a video show, right? <laughs> yeah, right? What's the difference? <laughs> but uh, I, such is life in paranormal world. Sometimes you run into drama like that. I wrote the yes. chapter anyway, and it was a great chapter, so it really didn't matter. But that was kind of irritating to have that happen. Sure. But I am sure. curious to know whether the ghostly happenings over there had anything f- to do with them selling. <laughs> I'm curious myself. I'm part of me wants to go in there and talk with the manager and just kind of see, you know, what's going on. Sure. They might be receptive, openly receptive, and and you're sensitive that way. So you you'd go in and you'd feel it right away. So yeah, plus you that could second them, floor. Plus, yeah, plus you could tell them about your former experiences there. And sometimes that actually impresses them. Oh, gosh, you were here already and you've done investigations in this building. And, oh, what happened? And then you can lead into, well, has anything happened while you've been here? And who who knows? They might say, come on over. You never know. Exactly. We'll have to see. Yeah, you'll have to let me know. I would love to know. Yeah, definitely. So you grew up in a haunted home and you mentioned... Um, that a lot of stuff happened there. Where was this um, home in New Jersey and what happened to you? So it was in Union County, and uh, which is East New Jersey. And um, I call them, I've come to call them uh, passersby. So they're not um, harmful. They don't have an agenda, as I call it. Um, they're simply passing by. And we got that a lot before I really knew how to protect and cleanse a house to kind of prevent things from coming and going. Um, they just came and went, but again, nothing stayed, nothing had an agenda. You know, there was nothing to be worried about. And so they were just, I don't know how to explain it. They were literally just passing by and every now and then we would communicate. Um, a lot of them were intelligent in terms of where you can communicate and interact with them. Um, I I mean, it took me a few years to really be comfortable with that. So, uh, otherwise I was quite scared in the beginning. 
Oh, you were young. That's it's a frightening thing when something like that ha happens and they don't understand. Did you have parents that understood it that they could explain it to you or not exactly? No, I did not, but I did have a couple friends who um who was able they were able to help me understand it better. In fact, my one friend who was very much into this, her father was a shaman. Oh, so okay. he really helped answer a lot of my questions. Oh, well, um, and it it was immeasurable. It was such a wonderful help there. But uh, yeah. in my home, my, my parents really didn't know anything about it. So they would just tell me, oh, it was a dream. It was a dream, you know. And so mm -hmm. I had to just deal with the fact that what was happening to me was a dream. And it wasn't until I got older that I really understood and um, started to learn more about it. Did you go to school to learn how to do these cleansings and uh, clearings of homes? No, not at all. Um, I so when I first was introduced to cleansing and and cleansings and and banishings and things like that, I came to it uh, through a um, I guess a magical or energy type avenue versus paranormal specifically. So, um, you know, I was in, I'm pagan and I had joined my first coven when I was 18 and they had been doing some cleansings and clearings and I learned a lot from them. And I brought that into my practice of paranormal investigating. Uh, and I've had such success with it that I just continued to, you know, tweak it a little to see what was needed, depending on what we're experiencing or dealing with. Um, but it's been, I've been using that for almost 30 years now. Oh, wow. That's great. And yeah. now when you mentioned before that the spirits in your New Jersey home were just passing through, why do you suppose they do that? You know, I don't know. I, I don't know. You know, nobody's been able to answer and spirits included can answer what's over there or what are you seeing? You know, nobody's been able to answer that or are are willing to anyway so um i don't know if it's just the veil is thin you know and they're just kind of walking by um seeing what's going on if they don't want to go to wherever they go at the end of the day i don't know maybe they're afraid of going crossing over or whatever um there's a lot of different theories there but um yeah i just there were a lot of passerbys in my house and then i noticed just in the world, just people just kind of hate to say wandering, but contently wandering. That's that's what I found. That's an interesting way of putting it. Yeah. <laughs> and you're you, you mentioned that you're a nurse. I imagine that can be very difficult for someone with gifts such as yours. I have interviewed other nurses in the past and they've had some unbelievable stories to share. I imagine you've had your own. I do have a lot of stories to share, but um, as a nurse specifically, I don't have any tie-ins with paranormal experiences, at least not That's as of yet. Really? Wow. Yeah, not as of yet. And I've worked in different avenues of nursing, um, everything from corrections to hospice care to, um, to you know, you know, end of life care, but I still have not experienced. So you, you've been with people at their time of death. Yes. Have you uh, seen when they are getting ready to pass how they, yes. uh, so you want to, you want to talk to us about that and tell them what some of them have done? Cause I, I find that very intriguing. It is. It's fascinating. Um, so what you, what you can see is toward the end of the days, especially if it's within hours, um, people will say, oh, I see my, then my mother, and this could be an 80 year old woman, for example, like, oh, I see my mother, or I see people they have lost prior to them, right. you know, being on their, on their bed, if you will. Um, and a sense of peace just really overwhelms them. And I find it very comforting that, um, I found when they do that, when they, I mean, who knows? Are they hallucinating? Are they really seeing their loved ones coming to get them? I can't tell you for sure, but I'd like to believe that it is their loved ones coming to get them and try to transition them as peaceful as as they can. Well, yeah, when you talk to people with near-death experiences, too, they say they see deceased loved ones um, 
mm-hmm. during their journey and who tell them they have to go back. Right. So I do feel like there is that something happening during that transition. And the day my dad died, he, he came to me and he let me know. My mother-in-law did too. So I do believe that we can firmly believe that there is that special something to help us when we transition into a better place. Right. I, I tend to believe that as well. Can you share some stories about those clearings and cleansings that you've done? Um, so the clearings and there's one, this is, this is a really wild one and I'm going to, I'll share it. It was in fact, um, the case itself was in Stanhope and which is, I guess, the Sussex Morris border, I think, or just South Sussex County. And it was an antique, uh, an art, excuse me, an apartment above an antique store. And which in and of itself might have its own you know, uh, attachments or, or what have you. But, um, we, it was me and uh, three other investigators and we had investigated this place multiple times. Um, there were, there was various activities from, you know, name calling and being woken up in the middle of the night and, um, you know, intelligent, um, spirits communicating with them. Some, good, if you will, or some, you know, um, harmless and some that, again, I say that they had an agenda, you know, because, Mm -hmm. you know, you usually when there's spirits in the house and you want to say, you know, you want them to go away, it's kind of like an unwritten rule that if you say firmly and you, you know, reclaim your house or reclaim your property and say, listen, I need you to go. You're not welcome here. You know, go ultimately. And for the most part, they go. But there are some that just don't want to for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. Um, So in one particular incident that I'm remembering is that this all began with a mirror. And um, I don't know if a lot of people may not be familiar, but mirrors are portals. Mm -hmm. And pretty, pretty good ones, too. Um, And never, never face two mirrors in front of one another because it makes for havoc. Yes, yes. So there was some kind of trauma in this house um, with children or this apartment with a couple children in the closet. That's what we were gathering. And we were able to find some information when our researcher was, you know, collaborating with the articles and with past owners and things like that. So we do always have a researcher on staff, too, you know, because you never know. No, you Um, never do. Yeah, so so um, there was, long story short, as best as I can, there was a really nasty, nasty spirit. I don't use the word demon. I don't use the word evil. I just, it was a nasty, powerful spirit. And um, one of the few that I encountered that was this powerful. And basically we were, kind of sealing, I was starting to seal and close the mirror so this entity couldn't come out and cause any more havoc. But uh, as I was doing it, and I was about, it's hard to say, but I do it energetically. Like, you know, you seal and you close the mirror. And as I was doing that, this figure, this guy, he was very tall. He had a hat on. I don't know what it is with top hats with some of these spirits, but he was, he could be considered like, at least six foot tall now granted i'm short but uh he was tall and thin and he was uh really nasty so he comes from one end of the mirror to the to the middle and he goes don't you dare and i said and just it took me aback and from what other people were saying as they were watching me do this it was almost like a pushing match in the mirror as i was literally ceiling closing the mirror and this spirit trying to get out so it was it was crazy it it was if i didn't experience it i would think yeah right you know i mean but it was crazy it was really one of the more um i guess scary you know i usually never get scared but that was pretty uh intimidating it really was you never you never found out who he was 
We never did. No, we didn't. We had some EVPs, um, and but we could not exactly pinpoint. You know, we have some theories, but nothing concrete. Um, but is it, it was. Is it sensible to think that he might be able to just go find another mirror to come through? Well, it's possible. I mean, not that mirror, but again, right. what's you wonder like what's in that realm in the world behind them? Right. You know, it's 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 crazy when you think about how vast it could be and how how much we don't even know yet. The um, New Jersey Spirit Hunters at one point when we were still the Lady Ghostbusters because she was in, they're just well, a bunch of women. Mm-hmm. We did an investigation in Washington at a home. And the woman had been experiencing a bunch of things for years. Um, But one of the things that she was most fearful of is that the angry spirit that lived there liked to try and push them down the stairs. And the whole family was aware of it, so they were careful of it. But now she was getting ready to rent out the house. And a a young family was coming in, and she was really concerned that they wouldn't believe and take it literally and not be careful when someone would get hurt, especially a child. So she had us come in and uh, sure enough, I, I mean, I, I'm privy to these things before we go in and I don't let anybody on the team know what I know because I want to make sure that what they're finding out coincides with what I know. You know, you don't exactly. want to know. Unbiased. Right. It's, it, it's a great way to collaborate because then you can really verify information. So mm-hmm. um, I didn't tell them. And, and of course, when we did the investigation, the spirit did try and pushed down and it the spirit in life was a, a nasty person so we we do know i think we can both agree that if you're nasty in life you're nasty in death that's just you take your personality with you and so this this guy was right. shitty he was he was a mean person and uh didn't like anybody that was living in the house so um we had a team member too at the time who was able to do what you do she was able to 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 cleanse and clear and lock and all that stuff mm-hmm. and we often thought because the home was in a section of Washington where, where there was a bunch of track houses and one looked just like the next, we often thought, well, what is it if if he just goes into another house? And right. I was always I was always really curious. And no one's ever come from that neighborhood to say, hey, you know, I've read your book and now he's in my home. Right. But I've always wondered if that's a possibility, you know, because you really don't want to be trying to protect everybody, but you can't always protect everybody. So. Right. No, that's a valid, that's a very valid point. Who's to say that it's not going to go next door or down the street. You know, if there is, you know, if there isn't any kind of restriction or, you know, whatever is placed on them, you know, I don't know. It's, it, that's a good point. Are you still doing paranormal investigating yourself? I am. Um, as of now, I think it was last year, excuse me, last year, the New Jersey Ghost Hunter Society had finally, I kind of called it, called it quits yes. and kind of disbanded. Yeah. But um, uh, I'm still doing investigations. You know, I do really enjoy, I know it sounds odd, but I do really enjoy the uh, hospitals, the prisons, the asylums, um, just because they are just so fascinating and full of just a variety of energy. Yes, not always positive or good, if you will, but it's in a lot of trauma is uh, involved in those, but it's just, it's amazing on an energy level, you know? Sure. Now, has your passion for forensic pathology and psychology ever bled over to your paranormal side, like leading to evidence or participation with local law enforcement? Um, no, not nothing for me personally, uh, you know, or, or professionally, I should say. Um, but I do um, like to go to, I guess, if there's any kind of, crime, not a crime scene, but history of uh, some traumatic event and, you know, try to investigate and see what's going on. Um, so, like, historically, if there was something that happened um, that was traumatic, um, yeah, I do like to investigate that. <laughs> You'd be surprised what you can come up with. I remember yeah, yeah. one of my one of my readers turned me on to the Rockport train wreck, which is incidentally somewhere near you over there. And I, I wasn't even aware of it when he told me. I'm like, I never yes. even knew that happened. He's like, Yeah, you should check it out. And I'm I'm 
pride myself on trusting my gut. So I had this feeling I should just take us there to the site and see if we can pick up on anything. It ended up being one of the best investigations we've had. And we, we went back three and four times after mm -hmm. that first initial one because it was so active. The place it's, was still so active. Yes, yes. We've been there before. And um, we actually went on the anniversary of. Oh, did you? Mm -hmm. Yes. We actually went on the anniversary and it was, it was pretty, pretty profound. There, we, we got a lot of good evidence and um, a lot of different members of the team corroborated some of the information that they were unfamiliar with that seemed to, um, again, seemed to coincide with a lot of the history. So it was, it was pretty good. And you know, you don't expect it to be. No, it gets very accurate. Excited. You're like, oh my gosh, can't believe it. Let me ask you, did you have a spirit messing with the the light, um, the railway light, the thing, you know, for just for the listeners, when you go over a track, it goes ding, 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 and the lights come on. Did you have spirits messing with the light? No, 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 we di we didn't, no. I guess we, we, we did. Uh, yeah, at one out of the four investigations we did. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it, at first we were all just walking on the tracks when this happened and we thought oh my gosh there's a train coming get off the tracks <laughs> and we all jump <laughs> off the tracks and we're like where's the gosh darn train and that's when it started and, and it just continued for the whole time that we were there which was really really cool and then when we, we went back we tried to have it happen again and it didn't i think it was all right we're, we're tired we tried you know getting you the first time you now i'm done <laughs> kind of thing right. <laughs> But um, one of my members who had been there on his own previously, he had said that that had happened to him. So I think it might happen occasionally whenever the mood strikes that particular spirit. I don't know. But it was really now, cool. It, that's interesting because maybe, again, we could always form as many theories or, you know, uh, ideas about what we think that is. But is it something intelligent that is trying to protect people on the track or is it residual? in that same respect of trying to protect people. Well, funny that you should mention the first point about somebody there trying to protect the track. Um, we did, because we had mediums that were there that were able to speak to spirit. In fact, one of them picked up a bunch of names and we ended up comparing it to the original manifest. And those names were on the manifest. So that was really, really cool. But That's we did great. connect to spirit. And off the top of my head, I can't remember his name, but he was... Um, one of the men on the train and he said that he was there to make sure that nobody would get hurt on the tracks anymore even though the tracks itself now are just i think um they're, they're not passenger rails anymore no uh, no he did make it a specific point to tell our medium that he just wanted to make sure that no one got hurt on the tracks anymore right. and then when he realized that we were understanding that he was communicating with us with the lights it continued throughout the night up until the point when we were when we, we were saying our goodbyes and he did it again as we were leaving, like, as a goodbye. It was it was just unbelievable. Yeah. And then uh, on another occasion when we went back, we got residual uh, audio of a uh, steam engine. You know how it goes? Ch -ch 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 oh, right. The yes. That's pretty wild. It. it was crazy. And, and the girls, obviously, when they were recording it, they had no clue because they were trying yeah. they were trying to reconnect with the male spirit that we had connected with the previous investigation and they weren't weren't able to. And this mm -hmm. was happening. And when they went home and they listened to it, it was like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe that happened. So things that you least expect are going to happen. happen. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. You know, when you were published in the anthologies, Ghostly Tales from America's Jails, what was mm -hmm. it that you had to share in that particular uh, story? Um, the NJGHS, uh, New Jersey Ghost Hunter Society, used to do um, a lot of our certification training at Eastern State Penitentiary in Philadelphia. And we would have the place from give or take 9, 10 p.m. to easy two, three o'clock in the morning, all to ourselves. Oh, wow. So, and that place is just phenomenal. I mean, just historically, it's amazing, but uh, paranormally, it's even more fascinating. Um, so the one story that I had told for that, for that book 
I was outside with a fellow investigator and um, I'm, are you familiar with Eastern State at all? Yes. Okay, so you're familiar with the initial um, center and then there's different cell blocks that are down like the spokes of a wheel. Yes. Okay, so we were outside one of the spokes of the cell block, um, not in the center and outside at the end. And I was changing batteries to my camera. Yes, we had cameras, you know. <laughs> <laughs> back before all these cell phones and and everything so i was changing my batteries and um the other investigator was with me just kind of hanging out and we were hearing in the cell block that we just had come out of not too long ago footsteps and a flashlight was going back and forth almost like let, let's say like a guard you know is walking down the hall with the flashlight just kind of checking on things so, but we didn't know what it was. We thought it was an investigator, you know, no problem. So, um, and they're going kind of fast. So, you know, investigators were going slow, you know, we're checking out things. And, but, so we thought it might've been one of the, uh, the guides there at, that worked at Eastern State or volunteered at Eastern State. So we were about to basically meet him at the entryway. So we got our stuff together. And he was coming up the hall. We heard him. We saw the flashlight. And as we were coming around the corner to get to the entry, we were basically going to meet up. And I was going to ask him a question I had. Gone. Nobody there. <laughs> Nobody ducked in the cell. Some of the, uh, In fact, those cells at that time had the chains on them. But still, we looked in the cells. We looked. It just disappeared. Um, mm. We thought that was really, really cool because we saw yeah. the flashlight, we heard the footsteps and nothing. So I thought that mm. was really cool. I, I really enjoyed that one. I got, yeah. you know, you get really excited. You really do. <laughs> you know, what well, it is, I do a, lot of, a lot of people don't realize that paranormal investigating can be quite boring. I mean, yes. yeah, we're socializing with one another and we're goofing off with each other and really enjoying each other's company, but... For the most part, you could sit there for several hours and have nothing happen. So when yes. you do get when you do get that little morsel, and if it's a really good one, you get so excited because you do. You, you've you really experienced do. this and it happened, and there's no denying it. And somebody else is going to say to you, "Oh, that's such bullshit," but you okay. know it happened. Exactly. I was there. I don't have to convince anybody, but it happened. So one hundred percent correct. Exactly. Um, it's, but it, you're right though. A regular investigation is on the, uh, on the spectrum boring. In fact, you know, you're sitting there, you're doing EVP, you're, you know, regardless if it's daytime, nighttime, cause you know, you can get activity during the day. It doesn't have to be all dark. Um, it just helps with other senses sometimes when it's dark, but, but you don't have to, um, but yeah, boring. So that's why whenever something happens, I get so excited. <laughs> And that's a classic misconception, too, to the public. They think it only has to be at night. They don't realize that this shit goes on all the time. I mean, I've been in cemeteries in the middle of the day and right. I've had stuff happen. And right. incidentally, cemeteries are great for people out there that are just looking to get started. Just go to an old cemetery and be open minded. Yep. You can try just old traditional methods to to get you started. And just take yeah. pictures in threes, one, two, three, one, two, three, and go home and have the patients to sit there and go through all those pictures. And you would be surprised what you have caught on camera. You're very, you're very true. In fact, you're very right. In fact, one thing, again, the NJGHS did, we use our little cemetery hunts to help train other people too on basics of equipment, on basics of investigation, because they are, they tend to be you know, for the most part, active, but calm. And I know you know what I mean by that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they're, no, they're living, living, they're living in the dead world. So this is, yes. they're there. Yes. <laughs> it's the, it's the living people I worry about that are in cemeteries. <laughs> exactly. Well, you know, I'm all about respecting spirit. I'm there for them. I'm there to right. acknowledge them and try and get whatever message it is that they want us to hear. I don't like to antagonize them or disrespect them. And I really don't like it when people do. I really don't. 
This I agree. Is always- I agree. And you don't provoke them, you know, um, besides the whole disrespect, provoking is if you don't even know what you're dealing with sometimes. And mm-hmm. if you keep provoking something, you, you know, you're going to get more than you asked for. You really will. What are your thoughts on all this newfound equipment that's been coming out? Because I know you started back in the day when you were just using regular cameras and recorders and it, there wasn't yeah, it all did, of this other No stuff. digital. It was, it was analog. Yeah. You know, yeah. we would use a tape recorder, you know, with even an external mic would be a fascinating thing because, you know, it wouldn't pick up the mechanisms of the, of the device, you know, and sometimes we even had, I picked up a lot of things on a disposable camera. I kid you not. I believe you. I yeah, believe it you. Was, yeah. So, and you know, I, and I do feel even now, like I like to just use the traditional methods of dowsing rods and pendulums and even just a simple flashlight because yep. it does work. It, they do work. I, you really sometimes don't even need this other stuff. So, I, I don't know. What do you feel about it? I think, I mean, I don't know. I haven't watched the shows in quite a while. In fact, I really kind of always stayed away from them. But so I don't know what new devices are really coming out. But I've seen people use, I guess, these REM pods or, you know, and spirit boxes and all that other stuff. Sometimes it just gets too much that you should go back to basics. And you should go back to that time where... Sometimes your intuition is the best and all your senses are heightened. You know, um, I just sometimes think sometimes too much is just too much. I work with a variety of people that do different things. I have people that just come in and don't use anything because they're so sensitive to spirits that they can come in and they can just zone everything out and just tune Mm -hmm. in spirit. And so we'll go with somebody who may have a REM pod being in another room and somebody else will be using their pendulum and and or dowsing rod. So, you know, to each his own, but everybody knows what works best for them. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I like to yeah. use my pendulum and dowsing rods. So I, I can't, I'm not as good as any of the people on my team and I don't claim to be, but I am sensitive enough that I, I, I know stuff to a degree. And then when we're all together, you know how that energy works when you're all together putting the pieces of the puzzle into one place. It just makes for a really good turnout. But um, I'm, I'm not good with some of this new found equipment. I just don't get yeah. it. I just, I'm not good with it. <laughs> no, no. The one thing that I, just to I one thing. did, oh. yeah, one thing that I really did use that I found amazing because I never used it before. I was actually at uh, the Sun Inn. It's um, in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. And that place is known to be very active. And sure enough, it is. We, we've gotten a lot of evidence there. What's however, the history behind it, Gina? Yes, yes. What, what's um, the however, history? I'm sorry? What's the history? Do you know what the history is behind that building? I don't remember now. It's been quite a oh. long time. Um, I, 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 ugh, it's been so long. Um, but it is. It's the Sun Inn in Bethlehem. I recommend it. Um, look it up. <laughs> so... Uh-huh. The one piece of equipment that I used for the first time and was blown away by was the parabolic microphone. Now, I know what that's used for in general, um, you know, with private investigators and things like that. But to use it on a paranormal investigation was amazing. We heard, I heard in real time, a spirit answering somebody's question. And I've never, I've never heard of this equipment. So could you just tell us oh, exactly okay. what so, it is? So it's called a parabolic microphone. And what it is, is like a device that's round. It almost looks like a small satellite dish kind of thing. Right. Um, and we could, you could attach it to recorder, which we had a recorder going at the time. So you could attach it to that. And you have headphones. So what it does, it picks up frequencies that you're, that a human ear can't normally hear. So it picks up those frequencies. And then if you have the headphones on and you have the recording going, somebody asked a question and there was a woman who replied and I was floored and I told them, uh, who you know, the people I was, I was with. And I said, you know, 
go ahead, keep going, because follow it up with another question, because there was an intelligent response. Mm -hmm. So that was amazing. You didn't have to sit and listen again, play back. It was in real time. It was, I have not experienced that since, but that was something I'm not going to forget. Wow. Yeah. You, you mentioned that your uh, many adventures with New Jersey Ghost Hunter Society has taken you to many places. Yes. Do you have any other good stories you'd like to share with us tonight? I would. Yes. Um, so, well, I don't know if we all love Gettysburg, don't we? Of course. Yes. So <laughs> Gettysburg, of course, historically and paranormally is a great place. So um, one thing in particular, I was staying at the Farnsworth Inn, um, which, again, is one of the more well-known, uh, I guess, hotels, but everywhere there is active. I think if you go to Gettysburg and not have an experience, something's wrong. So, yeah. uh, <laughs> um, so this, in pr this particular event, we it was a weekend event. We had like a dinner and investigation that evening uh, with Mark Nesbitt. Um, and a friend of mine who was going to stay with me, she couldn't come. So I stayed in the room by myself for two nights and it was the long street room, which is not even in the main hotel part of it or the main bed and breakfast. It was in where the library was at the time. I haven't been back there in a while, so I don't know if it's still set up that same way, uh, but it was the long street room and the bed. I have to explain it this way. The bed has bed steps. Now, granted, I'm only 5'1", <laughs> but I had to really jump even on the bed steps to get on. The, it was a huge bed. So there was a couple uh, incidents that happened that first night. You know, I heard some marbles in my room. I don't know. Couldn't see anything. Didn't think anything of it. But I was also five months pregnant with my first child. And I was hoping to... Uh, connect with the midwife spirit that was um, supposed to haunt that place. So I had a little motive there, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so I was sleeping on the the bed on one side of the bed. Nothing and like having trigger trigger items and you exactly. use yourself as a trigger. <laughs> That's exactly what I was doing. Exactly. <laughs> um, and so unlike the beds now where they have like memory foam or hybrids. Um, on a regular mattress, if you, a spring mattress, if someone sat on the bed on the other side, the bed would go down, right? You know, it would lean in. Right. Well, I was laying, sleeping, somebody laid on the bed next to me and it went in. So I say she, cause it, it was a female energy. She was touching my hip. So I was facing the other way. I immediately woke up. I went wide awake. And Ooh. I turned my face to see. I'm like, okay, I feel, I feel her. I sense her. Let me see her. So I turned my face and I couldn't see anybody. I saw the indentation. I felt her against my body, but I didn't see her. But I felt comforted, if that makes I, any sense. Just, and you knew it was her somehow. I did. So I thanked her for just sharing, you know, herself with me. And, and I hope, uh, you know, I'm, I, I'm staying here. I'm not causing any problem. And, but it was very comforting. So I, uh, I just, it was amazing. I loved it. <laughs> oh, that's cool. Yeah. Have you gone back to Gettysburg again since? Um, yes, I had, I had gone back and, uh, one experience, if you'd like to hear it, was in Triangular Field or Absolutely. Triangle Field. I would love to hear it. Okay. So are you familiar with Triangle Field? I'm not, no. Okay. So you know Devil's Den? Yes. Okay. So when you go to Devil's Den, it's a one-way, or at least at this point in time, it was a one-way road to kind of exit. And as you're exiting up on the, as you go up and around the hill, there's a big field with a gate. And that's Triangle Field. And there is so much activity there. There's so many issues with electric uh, batteries, things just not working anymore. You know, that whole phenomenon. Sure. Um, and so 
three friends of mine and I, this was after a ghost conference nonetheless in Gettysburg. Um, the one friend stayed in the car because she was scared. So we were teasing her and saying that, well, you're going to be alone. They're going to come after you. You know, we're just teasing her. Uh, yeah. um, so uh, myself and two other people um, traveled or, you know, ventured into Triangle Field. And, you know, sometimes um, the the grass is very high because it's not, you know, maintained. It's natural. So it was pretty high. And it was night. It was like two o'clock in the morning, even though it's not open then. So shh. <laughs> but, but it was like two o'clock in the morning and we're walking. And as we're walking, we heard a musket. Now, when I say musket, um, I mean, I go shooting. I'm familiar with shotguns and rifles and guns. It sounded like that powder. You know, how, do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I think I kind of understand what you're saying. So at first we were like, you know, we were saying, oh, it's probably just a, um, what do you call it? A reenactor just messing around with us, you know, um, cause it was nearby. So we said, okay, well, we'll just keep going toward it. Cause that's what we do. We go toward the things instead of running away. Um, so we're going toward the, the sound that we heard. And as we were getting further into the field, we heard it again, but this time we saw a flash and it was literally about 50 feet in front of us. And all three of us saw it. We were mm. shocked. Now, so to us, we kind of had the conclusion that maybe it's someone still fighting the war and they're mm. afraid. So we like, didn't uh, want to step replay yeah, constantly. Exactly. So we didn't want to step on any toes. We apologized. We said, oh, listen, I'm sorry that, you know, we're not trying to frighten you, but we'll we'll go back now. But we saw the flash 50 wow. feet. And it was crazy. And of course, where's all of our equipment in the car? Yeah. Yeah. Doesn't that always happen <laughs> <laughs> in the car? But again, it happened to me. And if it happened to someone else, I'd probably be like, yeah, right. You know, but it's. You know, personal experiences are invaluable. They really are. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and like I said earlier, we don't need to convince anybody. We're in it for the yeah. sheer joy of it for ourselves. And if somebody likes to listen to a story and wants to hear it, that's fine. We're not interested in whether you believe it or not, because we know what happens. So. <laughs> exactly. Right. You're right. Uh, any stories closer to home? Uh, let me think here. Um, yes, actually, um, right. Well, I don't want to say where, but where I live, but um, close to me in um, Hotel Belvedere in Belvedere, New Jersey, where they have like yeah, Victorian love, days. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, it's right next to the courthouse. It's it's called Hotel Belvedere. It's changed hands a few times. Uh, they have current new owners. I don't know how receptive they are. Um, I'm interested in talking with them, but the owners before them, uh, they let us in on an investigation and it did not disappoint. Um, did you go down into the basement where he had the, the, yeah. <laughs> the horseshoe, the, the horseshoe bar. bar, the original horseshoe yeah. bar. Yeah. Yes. And we went down there the, and there was some the listeners so that They know they used to go down there after a hanging and they used to auction off pieces of the noose. Right. Um, so, yeah, it, it, he really was trying to make a, a nice venue down there. The um, the owner previous, um, right? Nice he was there, nice man, but yeah, very active down there, huh? What happened? Yes, to you? very active. Pretty nasty stuff down there too. If you, uh, a lot okay, of the really, yeah, there was one particular guy that kind of like followed us out, almost to the point that I actually wanted to run up the stairs which wow. I've never felt that. And it was just very, very crazy. So that's one thing that, you know, I wanted to do, but we got, we caught EVPs like crazy, um, intelligent, residual. We caught various photography. Um, oh, one thing we caught, oh, this was amazing. This was your typical analog video recorder. And in the attic, that's my dog running around. I apologize for that. Oh, noise. that's all right. 
I have um, dogs running around here too, so don't feel bad. <laughs> okay, no problem. So in the <laughs> attic, we caught a video of a fire. And when I say it was a video, it, there's nothing there. Then all of a sudden you see a ball of fire just undulating. undulating. All of a sudden getting bigger and then poof, it was gone. Nobody was up there. It was the strangest thing. Come think, to find out. Think, yeah, go ahead. There was a I fire up saying. there. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was just going to say. I remember him mentioning that there was a fire up there. Yeah. Yes. And didn't you um didn't you say something about you were there with the television crew or something at one point? Or wasn't there a um a reporter that was with you on an investigation at a time at the Belvedere? Yes. Oh, in Belvedere? Um we didn't have a reporter. I didn't have a reporter with me in Belvedere. We've had it in other investigations. Um, you know, private residences as well as um uh, you know, public establishment. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for some you know, reason, I, it might have been somebody else I spoke to. They had said that uh, um, something happened when they were there, when there was a reporter there, which is kind of cool if it did, because then that makes the reporter a believer. <laughs> okay, I was actually at the Charlie Browns in Hackettstown with Laura uh, Halatic Hoffman, and we were interviewing, doing an interview uh, live, and the reporter experienced something there, and she was blown away. Yeah, see, that's great when you can make a believer out of somebody who <laughs> is influential in that way. Yes, we went, um, not this past Halloween, but the Halloween before that, we went um, on an investigation at um, the library in, um, oh my goodness, where the heck was it? It was in um, Booton, I believe, the Booton Library. Yeah, the, the Holmes Library. And we brought oh, along... Oh, okay. We brought along... Um, a reporter from Channel 11, and um, I mean, we had stuff happen, and but he wasn't truly convinced. I mean, like the, the fan started going, and nobody touched the fan, stuff like right. that. And, and the sensitives that were there were having stuff happen, but it wasn't anything that actually happened to him that he would say, um, "Yeah, I know that it happened." But he also spent a night in the uh, Amityville Horror Home with the Warrens okay. back back in the day. And okay. he, didn't, he didn't have anything happen when he was in that home either. So it's kind of Maybe a hit or miss. Yes. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> it's him. <laughs> I like that answer. <laughs> um, can you tell the listeners how they can find you in case they're in need of a clearing or cleansing? Sure. Um, so you can find me on uh, Instagram. I'm under roomflyer357. And I actually, I do witch tips on TikTok, and that's also Roomflyer357. Is that correct? Roomflyer357, yep. I'm going to have to find you, too. Roomflyer. And I'm going to have to connect. 357. Although, let me double check on the Instagram, because I think... Let me just confirm. Yes, Instagram is broomflyer213. Okay, because it's not coming up on 357. Okay, two. Yep, broomflyer213. There you are. I found you. I just followed you. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Well, this was really fun. Thank you so much for joining me today and telling me about your uh, adventures and stuff over the years. No, oh, you're very welcome. Thank you for having me. I know we talked about this for a while. Well, you're in my books, so it made sense to have you on the show if I could get you. <laughs> nice Thank you. Can I nice. introduce can I introduce a budding starting of a paranormal investigator? Absolutely. Go right ahead. Okay, so over here she just walked in. This is my 13-year-old daughter. Hi. And she is fascinated by the paranormal. In fact, she uh, has her own gifts and own talents that uh, oh, she's, she's she embracing. Sorry? She's, embrace, she's embracing them. I apologize. My dog. One more time. Your daughter, your daughter is embracing her gifts. She is. She is. Wonderful. And um, she's trying really hard to make sense of everything and 
to understand it better and to use it for for the best way she can but she loves investigations and she wants to start going on some more oh that's great and you know what there's nothing better than having a supportive mama who knows which way to to steer her and which direction and how to teach her because i've seen just from interviewing people over the years that those people who have had that support in their growth um are, are so much more adept and in tune than were were they not to have somebody supporting them or helping them so i wish you really well in your Thank endeavors you. yeah hi honey it was Thank nice you. meeting you it was nice meeting you too have a good night ladies thank you have a good night too bye-bye you all like listening to this week's episode and you're into all things paranormal check out my other show Eleanor Wagner's Creeping It Real podcast out of the Coast to Coast Entertainment Network, which is available where.